OK, now I want to spend a little time. Um, yeah, did I miss? Yes, I just wanted to add something to, hmm. uh, to, they're, to they're actually taxing the Indian population very highly by inflation. So what they're doing is their they're inflation is both taxing the owners of capital and it is taxing as far as they have uh, cash profits. So inflation does not affect your uh, real capital goods. What it affects is your uh, profits in bank, that's your cash in bank. Uh, because if you have inflation, the value of that cash goes down, and that's the kind of taxation that you impose on them. You, at the same time, are also imposing a taxation on the working class because you have jacked up the prices of all essential commodities, including food, food grains, and uh, thereby poor have to work harder to achieve the same amount of food. In fact, they were living on smaller amounts of food because Britain was doing a second form of taxation. One form of taxation was to create inflation. The second form was it was sucking out the surplus grains from specifically from Eastern India, from Bengal, uh, and building up grain reserves in both Australia and the UK. These grain reserves were built out by pulling out grains from Bengal, and this means that there is a localized increase in price, which causes the Great Bengal Famine. So it's a uh, at one level you are inflationary taxing them through inflation. At the same time, you're pulling out grain because they were saying we need to build up grains for uh, the home motherland's population, for the, the British and Australian population, and for the troops. So actually, um, India was taxed very high. It was only a different way of taxation. No, I disagree. But uh, maybe it will become clear when I, uh, as I go along, huh? because I disagree with those formulations. So um, let's go into the social results of this, um, of this war activity. And what I'll do now is to go by social class. So what happens to different groups in Indian society as a result of these activities of the colonial state? Uh, and again, there's a kind of caveat here that when you, in India as elsewhere in the world, if you're looking at upper classes, they're more difficult to investigate than the lower classes. Because you can, it is easier, you can ask questions if you're talking to an agricultural labor or industrial worker, you cannot really interrogate a landlord or an industrialist. Of the many things which increase with money and wealth, the ability to evade scrutiny is one. Uh, this means, in practice for us as historians, that while statistical data can be used for the lower classes, when you're looking at Indian upper classes, then anecdotal data is better than statistical data. Simple point, if everybody's evading taxes, there's no point looking at the formal returns. Now, so let's begin with the business classes of Indian society. Before the, the war gave a boost to Indian business, before the war began, there had been a slump, and stocks, for example, of textiles had accumulated with manufacturers. After the war began, there were substantial orders from government, and stocks were quickly sold. To a British businessman, it seemed, he said, Indian, that Indian businessmen are waking up good and strong during the war. There was an income tax investigation commission set up after the war, and it said that the conditions of the war have brought about a breakdown in the working of the income tax department. We just can't keep track. So much money is being made. If you look at, for example, um, the business histories, there is one of the DCM group, Delhi you know of the D DCM, Delhi Cloth Mills? No? OK. This is a, at one time, all our towels used to be made by DCM. Now the world has changed. But, uh, so uh, this is run by, uh, was run at that time by Lala Sriram. Anybody has heard, not heard of Lady Sriram College? OK, so that's you know, set up by, uh, uh, by the family there. The authorized biography of Lala Sriram uses phrases like unprecedented boom and bumper profits in recording the prosperity of the war years. And while it talks about the integrity of DCM and so on, it talks about other groups in harsh terms. It refers very frequently to widespread hoarding and black marketing. When you have a textile control order in June 1943, and that order requires mills, wholesalers, and retailers to declare their stock position, no less than seven months national supply is unearthed. In 1943, in conditions amounting to a cloth famine, the textile industry in India as a whole declares the largest profits of its entire career in 1943. There's a cloth famine in the country. 
but the officially declared profits of the textile industry are larger than they've ever been. And the general impression is that the undisclosed profits are four times the disclosed profits. It's that good for business. There is a wave of enthusiasm and enterprise among industrialists. Industry does well because imports are controlled or curtailed by lack of shipping, because the ships which would bring imports in are being used to take soldiers all over the place, uh, and because Japan becomes an enemy, and government has to buy more and more during a war. In Bombay, in the 1950s, the sociologist Gurye had a symposium in which there, was, there were various people asked to speak, and one of them was a businessman who said, uh, listen to him, he says, I am a businessman of the 40s, and I have seen nothing except prosperity in business. It's that easy at this time to make money. Uh, this prosperity is also explained by the terms and conditions on which Indian industry sold products. The controlling authorities, like the Textile Control Board, were packed with vested interests. So the prices which they fixed provided a large profit margin. The Textile Commissioner of India, a man called Velody, later he said as much. He said, we created a textile board was created. Industry was given a predominant voice on the board. It was decided to form a number of committees. The most important of these committees was the Industries Committee, consisting wholly of representatives of industry, whose main function was to advise the government on prices, etc. So it was the industrialists who fixed the prices of products sold to government. And um, this was very different, for example, from what was done in America or in Britain. Uh, <coughs> Gorwala, another ICS officer, he said that in control, in controls, government was not successful, that they should seek non-official cooperation was desirable, but that it should be sought exclusively from parties most intimately concerned, should establish them in the position of arbiters in their own cases was an error of the first magnitude. So government is selling to, industrialists are selling at prices which they decide. The situation in Britain is very different. Profits are not of the same order because the British, British businessman who operates in a formally organized economy could not evade taxes easily. The excess profits was, uh, tax was 100%. There was a black market, but there is a consensus in British history that the black market was never large and the people did not treat the war as an opportunity for a great display of dishonesty. So there's a big contrast, and this is where at this point I would disagree about how industry is controlled. For industry in India, it's a wonderful time. In, in, in India, production increases slightly, but profits increase hugely. In Britain, production increases hugely, but profits remain more or less the same. It's a big difference. Uh, as, so that's for business. Now let's come to the peasantry. For much of India's peasantry, World War II means the tremendous relief of waking up from the nightmare of the 1930s, which were dominated by the Great Depression. During the Depression, prices of agricultural products fell, and peasant earnings fell with them. Now, old demands, <coughs> uh, during the Depression this happened, but in 1940s, there is an inflationary situation, and prices rise. And as prices rise, peasants do very well. Inflation lightens the burden of debts, money, rents, and land revenue. The same amount which you're selling if you have a surplus, uh, in the 1940s, with prices going up 300%, uh, it gets you three times what it would get you earlier. But the land revenue demand remains the same. Uh, and it can therefore be met by selling a half or a third of the produce previously required to meet it. The problem of rural debt, which is a big thing in Indian history, that is relegated to the background according to the RBI, Reserve Bank of India. It said it is almost forgotten by August 1943. There is a pamphlet called uh, Wartime, Pam uh, Wartime Crisis, Oxford University Press pamphlet, by the economist P.J. Thomas. He was later a member of the assembly. He was called the Malayali Keynes, and so on and so forth. Uh, and he writes, there are, due to the prevalence of, a, of wide prevalence of small scale production, the number of producers is large, and the advantage of high prices is reaped by a very great number of persons. So he says, it's certain that the cultivating classes have obtained larger net incomes than before. I stress this because normally Indian history is told as a sob story. 
oh, it was terrible, we, we died, we were exploited, and so on and so forth. This is actually a very different thing, where people are saying we've never had it so good. Um, and he says such opportunities come only once in a blue moon. We can see some of these processes unfolding at the level of one village through the observant eyes of M. N. Srinivas. M. N. Srinivas associated with the, he's the biggest sociologist of that generation, associated with which ideas? Sanskritization, vote bank. vote bank. So you know, it is something like vote bank is so much a part of our thinking that even the origin or dominant class, these, are, these came out of the mind of Srinivas. And he did field work around 1948 in a Mysore village. He published it as the remembered village. We talked to villagers. And they said, they contrasted, these are Srinivas's words, the present prosperity with the poverty of the interwar years 1918 to 39. Rice was very profitable, so was sugarcane. Villagers made gains mainly from sales of their produce on the black market, where prices were very high. Controls existed not to be obeyed, but to be evaded. Every villager with a surplus had sold as much as he could on the black market. Srinivas wrote, quote, the increased prices for agricultural products since World War II were a crucial factor in the economic betterment of the village. It's as if the black market brings color into rural life. Villagers, what do they do with the money? They travel to town more often. They send sons, not daughters, more frequently than before for education in urban areas. Their values change. Earlier, surplus cash among the rural rich would have gone into jewelry and land. After the war, some of the cash goes into new enterprises like shops and rice mills. In Srinivas's judgment, Men who would otherwise have remained landlords became, his phrase, incipient capitalists. So the idea is the war change is not just the villagers, rich villagers, income, but his outlook. And if you want to see this most starkly, you look at Punjab. Punjab is closely linked to the war. It's the recruiting ground, traditionally. It has a wheat surplus, so it sells a lot of wheat. Malcolm Darling, an Indian civil service officer of the Punjab Carter, who authored classic works on the Punjab peasantry, went from place to place saying, what is happening in the villages? And one sign of the new prosperity which he commented upon was the much larger number of silver ornaments, bracelets, anklets, rings, worn by peasant women. Less ostentatiously, prosperity was enjoyed by sipping tea. Now something we take as so ordinary. Uh, it's actually a returned soldier's habit. They get it as part of their rations, and then they go back to the gaon afterwards and it becomes a habit. So uh, this habit of drinking tea, he says, stole into the village after World War I and spread throughout the recruiting areas of the North because of World War II. And Darling concluded his book by saying, or his work, by saying, on the purely material side, there were many changes for the better. The 300% rise in prices, which set in sharply in 1942, had put more cash into the peasant's pocket than had ever been there before, and he had wisely used it to pay his debts and redeem his land. For the first time, for at least two generations, debt was no longer a millstone round the peasant's neck. With the demands of the moneylender greatly reduced, and those of the government satisfied by the sale of less produce, the peasant had much more left for himself and his family. So debts to cooperative banks and moneylenders were liquidated. This is another kind of, you know, just to give a flavor of things, uh, they had something called the Punjab Board of Economic Inquiry, uh, and which employed investigators who went into the villages. And there was one who did a survey of villages in Ludhiana district, a man called Ram Swarup Nata. And what did he see? He said the war is a boon, his word for people in general, and a windfall for cultivators. He said, on the whole, the cultivator is much better off financially than ever before. But what he did was, he went from village to village collecting the sayings, the muhavras, the proverbs of Punjab villages at the time. And just listen to them. One of the things which the Punjabi villagers are saying is all people are enabled to get their bread. Sare roti khan lag gaye So everybody's hungry before, it's not so. But with the war, sare roti khan There's another, you know, our class con conscious society. It's a kind of sneer. 
even servants are putting on clean clothes. So much money is coming in. Even servants wear clean clothes. Nok rande chitte kapad. Can you imagine? There's another saying. The war and the high prices brought about equality in Punjab. Jang te mehengai it sare ikko jaye ho gaye. People, everybody has something. It's no longer. Or the jat who does not see money during war days, what kind of jat is he? It's a disgrace. Just jat ne aaj paisa nahi vekhya, jat ke no afanda. What kind of jat are you? You cannot make money in the war. So he collected these things and they give us a sense of what people were felt in the villages of Punjab. It's a kind of fairy tale time. People are wearing gold and silver and they're eating ghee and they're drinking tea and maybe they're putting ghee in their tea, God knows. But, uh, you know, even if you put some salt, take it with a pinch of salt, this is a time of unprecedented prosperity in uh, Punjab society and to some degree in Indian society. So we've seen the peasant and we've seen the business class. When you come to the Indian middle class experience, then it's more mixed and it depends on age. For the young, life becomes much easier because middle class jobs become available in plenty. At first, unemployed people look for jobs, then employers look for them. Recruitment rules have to be relaxed. College hostels where many people are stuck waiting for a job, studying because you can't get a job, uh, they begin to empty. Places like Foreman Christian College in Lahore and so on, the hostels, hostel seat, no problem. Uh, good accommodation if you choose to stay on because everybody gets a job in the army. And what, what we would say is, ek anari, ek bimar, that kind of situation. Uh, middle class youths are recruited by the military or in civil supplies departments. The problem of educated unemployment in India is solved for a decade till 1953 when according to the planning commission documents, that's when it's a problem to get a job again. But for 10 years, you have a, some education, no problem at all. But what happens if you have a job, middle class job already? For people already employed, the war means a falling standard of living. Inflation wounds people who have a fixed income. Two surveys in Calcutta are carried out by the Indian Statistical Institute in 1939 and 1945. Indian Statistical Institute, our very own ISI, <coughs> is one of the few places in India which has a world reputation as an academic institution. In that their journal, Sankhya, is a journal which people from all over the world at one time wanted to get published in. It was founded by Mahalanobis and it was a very, very uh, good institution. So they do surveys of the middle class in Calcutta. And if you're judging the standard of the Bengali middle class, what will you, what commodity or product will you look at? Exactly. So they do exactly what, I mean, you know, uh, exactly as you say. The price of fish had gone up five or six times. The consumption of milk was halved. And the consumption of eggs was a quarter of the pre-war figure. No wonder the great historian Jadunath Sarkar, historian of the Mughal Empire, the teacher employed by the government most of his life, he wrote later in Independent India in 1949, he wrote when he was 78, he said the government of India, the present and its predecessor, 1939 to 47, so he doesn't distinguish too much between the British and the independence. He says, have robbed me of four-fifths of my wealth by issuing bogus notes and base metal rupees I am compelled in my old age to earn fresh money if I am not to exhaust all my savings by spending them on current monthly expenditure. So middle class, already employed, older people are very badly hit. Young people get jobs which they're happy to have. If you look at the industrial working class, then the picture is gloomy, full stop. Employment increases, longer hours are worked, but real wages fall. There is a Harvard PhD thesis on working class standards of living in India, 1939 to 50. And the finding of the author is that there is a cut in real wage of about 30% in the years 1939 to 43. So interesting here that when the, the businesses are making the highest profits, the standard of living of the workers is absolutely the lowest. And the regaining of the working, uh, of the pre-war standard is only around 1950. Now, here's the interesting part. The 
trend in Britain is completely different. Where Ernest Bevin, the leading trade unionist, and this comes to the question which was asked there, becomes Minister of Labor with a seat in the cabinet. During World War II, the wages of labor in Britain rise 80%, while the cost of living increases about 30%. So while the condition of the British working class improves, the condition of the Indian working class deteriorates as it struggles unsuccessfully to retain its pre-war standards of living, which come back only in 1949. That's for industrial workers, who are, again, because India is not industrially developed, so it's about two to three million. The big numbers are agricultural laborers. And for agricultural laborers, it's a disaster story. Uh, there is an Agricultural Labor Inquiry Committee in the early years of independence, 5051, which says the finding is that 85% of the wages of a laborer are spent on food, and yet in 96% of the cases, this gives less than the minimum number of calories which are adequate for nutrition. The economist Dandekar of the Pune Institute, he reflects on the, this data and says, what is poverty if not this? that 85% of your money goes on food, and even that doesn't give you the minimum number of calories. Over most of India, prices are rising fast. And uh, they are rising faster than wages. So agricultural labor is very, very badly hit. The index of prices rises more than 100 points more than the, uh, than the wage. And what this means is that hungry agricultural laborers become hungrier still. This is the process which reaches its height in Bengal, which displays during the Great Bengal Famine of 1943, the worst misery in India. Great Bengal Famine is perhaps three or two million dead. Uh, food in Bengal mainly means rice. Uh, the price of rice rises phenomenally. It becomes too high for the poor to afford. Uh, agricultural laborers are very badly affected, uh, but sharecroppers and peasants tend to escape. So it's a crucial thing that in a situation of high inflation, what matters is do you buy food or do you sell it? If you're selling it, good for you. If you're buying it, God help you. This is um, in, in the rural economy. Uh, by 1943, July, starvation in the districts increases. Um, the destitute people board trains for places where food is available. Many people come to Calcutta. Um, Military personnel take over removal of corpses from the streets. And then you have epidemics of various kinds. Uh, the point here is that in sheer scale, the tragedy of the Bengal famine is like comparable to any other of the world war. It dwarfs other incidents in India. The number of Bengalis who dies is perhaps half the number killed by Hitler in the so-called final solution. Uh, it is another perspective to note that the dead outnumber the entire Indian working class, which is about two million, so you more than that die. And, but look at it another way. The number of soldiers who die in India are about, on Indian soldiers who die is about 30,000 during World War II. But the number of casualties in the Bengal famine is about 100 times that number. So if people, India does suffer, but it's, Indians do suffer, but it is the agricultural laborers who suffer due to starvation. Uh, and they die in a ratio of 100 is to 1 compared to the soldiers. British social history follows an opposite trajectory. The British government initially expects food rationing, long hours of work, general worries of war to damage public health. Exactly the opposite happens. This is a very strange and interesting thing, that war is actually very good for the health of the British public. Uh, Aware that a healthy workforce is important to the war effort, the British government watches over its health anxiously. Food supplies are controlled as never before. Prices are stable. Food is abundantly available to farm laborers and industrial workers who increase their earnings with unequivocally positive results. The health statistics show that in 1942, there was a decrease in major infections in Britain and a lowering of maternal and infant mortality rates and the proportion of stillbirths and death rate among civilians were the lowest ever recorded in English history. There is a British National Food Survey Committee which remarks in a report published in the mid-1950s, they say, from a nutritional point of view, the working class diet was more satisfactory in 1944 than at any time before the war. 
So what a difference. In India, starvation deaths are occurring, but in Britain, poorer people are improving their quality of life. And at the same time, richer people in Britain are more heavily taxed. Rationing covers the whole country, uses the slogan of equal shares for all. It becomes a symbol of the state's fair play. The chairman of the British National Food Survey Committee says the controlled economy, full employment, strict rationing of basic foods leads to, quote, a great reduction in group differences of all kinds. The British historian A.J.P. Taylor says, broadly speaking, the entire population settled at the standard of the skilled artisan. This was a come down for the wealthier classes. You have a question? Yeah. I, I just want to know, um, com compared to what period is this better? Is it just the past? And how was the census carried out? I mean, was, was it sampling or was it actually going door to door to every worker's house and seeing whether they're, they're Okay. Okay. Good. I, I'll, I'll take that up. Huh? Uh, uh, for the time being, you see, there are different social groups and they're handled in different ways. Huh? So the ISI would use their own statistical methods. It's a small group. The, um, for the, um, for the uh, Punjab peasantry, it's different kinds of anecdotal evidence, huh? uh, village surveys and so on. So it depends on the groups we are looking at. And the reference point is pre-war. Okay? So the reference point is with pre-war. We, we can take that up in in greater detail. In British history, there is the debate on the issue of a leveling of class. So you have a book with the title, Leveling of Class. The question is, has leveling of class occurred? To what extent? For how long? If the distribution of property is seen as a marker of class, then change is slight. If income is considered, then change is great. And if everyday consumption is taken as an index for British history, then leveling of class is much more in evidence. But the contrast is what I'm trying to get across, that in Indian history, such a debate is unthinkable. Because Indian society has moved in a different direction. In Indian society, the scale of starvation and prosperity is both obvious, and both scales are new. It's as if chasms, gulfs have opened at the, le in, at the level of food consumption in India. Now, let me try to draw together these strands in a few minutes. Um, because I veered off in various places, uh, I'd want to pull this together, to a kind of conclusion about Indian society and about state and class relations in India. Um, in short, what I've been saying, or what I've been emphasizing, is the differential impact of the war. That it's different in India, it's different in Britain, it's different in India. In India, it's different for business, it's different for agricultural labor, it's different for the middle class, it's different for Punjab, Bengal, Madras, etc., etc. Okay? So the differential impact of the war is the central argument, you know. <coughs> among regions, as among social classes, the war produced both victims and beneficiaries. Some people starved. Other people ate more than they had ever done. It's fairly accurate to claim that Punjab prospered, <coughs> Bengal suffered. The wartime economic boom especially the agrarian boom in Punjab, which people don't write about, I've emphasized it today. This economic boom was probably politically relevant, providing some kind of cement to keep the British going in India. If people are doing well, they have no great desire to throw the regime out. There are, there's lots of evidence which I've cited for the wartime prosperity of Punjab, but little reflection. Why? Maybe because of nationalism. Because, uh, the prosperity of Punjab uh, is an inconvenience in a nationalist narrative. Bengal famine, fine. Nationalist narrative is see how much we suffered. Bengal famine fits into it. Punjab prosperity does not fit into it. Yet I'm saying unless you understand Punjab prosperity, <coughs> you can't figure out how the British actually managed to rule with so little uh, dissent in World War II. And of course, later on, you had the Punjab partition and the riots, and that shadow fell over it. So the Punjab prosperity was, uh, uh, of the war was forgotten. By contrast, the tragedy of the Bengal famine was publicized. Here was conclusive proof of the evils of imperialism. While the starvation of Bengal validated the messages of Indian nationalism, the prosperity of Punjab was, in a nationalist context, an inconvenience to be overlooked. 
arguments over causes and numbers of the Bengal famine have persisted over the years. And that is what was being referred to, I think, when Bengal was being talked about. The official famine inquiry committee estimated a mortality of 1.5 million. Later, the economist Amartya Sen calculated 3 million dead. And there is a subsequent study by Maharatna which says 2.1 million. So now, this is the thing I'm putting to you to think about. You have very good economists, a Nobel laureate, and yet you have variations of a million in the mortality estimates, despite all this statistical professional fanfare, fanfare. This may be the aspect worth pondering over. So little was known about the victims. They lay beyond the gaze or the <coughs> vision of the state. Where numbers are hardly known, uh, voices are unlikely to be heard. If we judge the significance of an event by the mortality, how many dead, then the Bengal famine must unquestionably rank as the most important event in India in the 1940s. Even partition riots, maybe 200,000 dead, 500,000 dead. Here we are talking maybe 3 million. If, so no doubt, if you are judging importance by death, then the Bengal famine is the most important thing which happens in India. But if we judge by its impact on state power, then the famine falls, demotes, plummets to a much lower place. Why? Because the people who die are agricultural laborers. The real victims of the Bengal famine were the rural poor. In a situation in British India where franchise, the right to vote, was based on property and education, these people were not on the provincial voters' lists. If they were, you would know whether 2 million or 3 million died. And although many people died in the streets in Calcutta, none actually belonged to the city. City dwellers were safe covered by various food schemes. It was the rural poor who came to the city to die. For all their misery, they remained marginal. The dead were not articulate actors in the theaters of modern Indian politics. In the great Calcutta killing of 1946, about 5,000 people were slaughtered in the communal riots. That threatened the Bengali upper classes, the Bengali Bhadralok, and a furor followed, and it is said it led to the partition of India. So 5,000 can lead to the partition of India, perhaps, but 3 million make no real big difference. Uh, this is because the children, the people who died in the famine, but, uh, were different. The children of the Bengal Renaissance were unharmed by the Bengal famine. If a beggar died on somebody's doorstep, it was no doubt a terrible thing, but it's an essential part of the upbringing of the Indian middle and upper classes, of us, to learn to ignore at close quarters the clamor and cries of the destitute. We do it all the time. The Great Bengal Famine was a colossal human tragedy, but it was politically unimportant. Those who died in the Bengal Famine could not even be counted properly because socially they counted for nothing, or for so little. Not nothing, but for so little. Now, I was saying, look beyond nationalism as a category of analysis. How does this come into this analysis? What I'm saying is, the books say India suffered. This is what he said also. I'm saying, no, India did not suffer in the war, but many Indians did suffer. If you are a Bengal famine victim, you've died and you've suffered. But the rich peasant is also an Indian. And so is the industrialist. And there are many people with a surplus to sell in Indian society. So this question, the nationalist question, what happens to India, conceals the diversity of Indian experience. Uh, so this is the methodological premise, that there is much more to Indian history than meets the nationalist or imperialist eye, for that matter. It is easy for, an, for nationalism to generate a lot of outrage. But regional and class analysis, as well as international comparison, generates more insight. This is what the essence of it I'm trying to get across. That this society is, in a huge sense, a class society. In this, in this stuff which I'm doing, some of which is published, I remember coming across a footnote, um, which, which is a footnote here. The records of a Madras hospital showed that in the paying ward, a baby weighed, at birth, weighed one pound more than in the charitable general ward. And that is class in India. That it begins when you're in your mother's tummy. 
by the time you hit planet Earth, there's already a difference of a pound in your birth weight at the time. That's because that's what it means in terms of the nutrition your mother gets. Uh, and again, to get ahead of this story a little bit, this is where Britain is different. Because in a society where you have conscription, where you say everybody has to serve in the army, you're able to consolidate nationally, whereas in India, to get the war running, you have to divide nationally uh, and get money from whom you can through inflationary means and so on. International comparisons are instructive. If not at first glance, they help at the second. Wars evoke among allies the rhetoric of a common effort. What I've tried to do in today's talk is to look beneath the rhetoric, beneath the superficially similar enhancement of government power in war into the content of words like war effort and rationing. The rulers of the state in London and Delhi shared the same language, the English language. But the two states functioned in utterly different ways. As Indian politics, colonial politics, are often alleged to have been molded by British political culture, our parliament is this way because of the British and so on and so forth, it's important to recognize this distinction, that the same word in different places can mean different things. Um, and, you know, so rationing in Britain means bacon, rationing here means rice. The word rationing is the same, but what it's covering up is completely different, or what it represents. Equality versus, uh, and versus subsistence. And therefore, if you can see this for the word rationing, think about words like economic planning, privatization, globalization. This is the important distinction, that the same vo vocabularies can conceal very different realities. The thread running through the whole lecture has been the stark contrast during World War II between the war effort of the state in Britain and of the colonial state in India. Now, you can qualify it, and I suppose, in different ways, but more insight is gained if the two pictures are contrasted. The contrast clarifies two different types of relationship between the state and social classes. And here, I'm going beyond the was British rule good or bad for us? Because you know, there you're getting into repetition. Many people would say it's good. Many people would, in Britain would say it's good. Many people here would say it's bad. And I'm saying, actually, there is something we can say from history which goes beyond the claim that colonial rule is civilizing and good, or the cry that it's exploitative and cruel. And uh, to get ahead to it, the crux of it is it depends on who you are. Ours is a society of class or caste status, etc. The state in Britain was able to command men from all sections of British society, including its upper echelons, to join the army. The colonial British government in India could not compel men to join the army, but attracted some of them by offering economic benefits. As far as war materials went, Britain expanded her industrial production. In India, production could be expanded little. The requirements of war were met mainly by constricting civilian consumption. Production in Britain expanded, but the British con curbed their consumption by an effective system of rationing which included the upper classes. Consumption in India was di diminished by a rise in prices which left the upper classes unscathed. If you had the money, there was nothing you could not buy in India. British war expenditure was financed to a great degree by taxation. Indian war expenditure was financed by printing paper which led to inflation. Prices remained stable in Britain. In India, they increased threefold. Such different state activities produced different social results. There occurred some leveling of British society, but the war widened the cleavages or gulfs within Indian society. In Britain, rationing brought about a greater equality in the consumption of food and a definite improvement in nutrition. In India, even as the more prosperous sections of the peasantry gained from the rise in agricultural prices and the profits of industrialists flowed like water through the tax net, about three million people died in the Bengal famine. So again, because I'm coming to a kind of theoretical formulation, World War II, British upper classes are forced to send their children to the back battlefront, to curb their own consumption, and to contribute large amounts of money to the national treasury. At the same time, desperate though it was for resources, brutal though it was to the Indian lower classes, the behavior of the British colonial state towards the Indian upper classes remained comparatively gentle. The Indian upper classes could not be conscripted. Their consumption could not be curtailed easily. Their profits could not effectively be taxed. In India, few sacrifices were required from the powerful social classes. On the contrary, as we've seen, substantial sections of Indian society 
benefited very substantially. So you have two states, to go back to your question, two states <coughs> working desperately to extract resources, but they cannot select identical targets for resource extraction. Faced with the emergency of war, the British state squeezed the British upper classes, while the colonial state starved the Indian lower classes. Moreover, in Britain, a successful war effort required the state to satisfy the sectional interest of the British lower classes. In India, it required the state to satisfy the sectional interest of the Indian upper classes. Overall, the war effort in India was run on the terms of to the benefit of the upper classes. This was not the case in Britain. How does one put this in a kind of theoretical two-line formulation? What does it suggest when a state fighting a prolonged war, desperate for additional resources, fails to squeeze much out of the wealthy or powerful social classes? A relationship of power between the state and social classes is revealed with unusual clarity in such a case. And the formulation is this in its relationship to the utter upper classes of society. In its relation to the upper classes of society, <coughs> the late colonial state in India was, compared to the state in Britain, a much weaker creature. This is where we go beyond the traditional picture, that it's actually weak when it's dealing with the upper levels of the society it governs. Uh, I conclude by pointing out that this relationship leaves a legacy. In subsequent decades in independent India, the state has swollen enormously, employing many times more manpower, spending many more times more money. But the time when it can effectively extract resources from the top levels of Indian society, that time hasn't fully come as yet. I'll, I'll treat myself to a lozenge while and maybe I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah. <coughs> makes sense, but my response, you know, my response is that it's okay to compare apples and oranges if it tells you something new about either apples or oranges. So yeah, you, when you have comparisons, um, when you have comparisons, obviously situations are not identical, otherwise you wouldn't be able to do a comparison. Uh, my view of these things is purely heuristic. If you do a comparison, is there something you're able to say on that basis which hasn't been said? Mm. Now, what I'm saying is that people have posed the question, was British rule civilizing and good? Was it exploitative and cruel? Mm. But what you can see here is that if you're rich, you, to, so the argument of this whole thing is, which country would you rather live in at this time? The answer is, it all depends on who you are. If you're rich, then you'd rather live in India because you won't get your head blown off by a gun and you'll get everything you want. If you're poor, you'd much rather live in Britain because, because your standard of living will increase. Now, uh, and the point which is made is that the British government is able, so the exploitation question misses out the fact that the British government, the national state, let us say, is able to impose sacrifice and control its upper layers to a much greater degree than a colonial state is able to do. Now, this is what comes out of the comparison. 
it is a comparison of apples and oranges, but nobody's, now I'll leave it to you to decide which one is the apple and which one is the orange, but, but this formulation, to my knowledge, hasn't been made before. So if it comes, it works, if it, does, if it doesn't, you know, it's to be judged by results rather than methodology. <laughs> Where it would become interesting is why does the, is the conclusion wrong? So that's where I'd throw the question back. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Um, so when you spoke about how the industrial gap did very well, you mainly took the example of the cloth mill, right? Now the cloth mill uh, didn't do well at that time, especially since cloth was very essential for every part of the war effort. They were making parachutes, tents, etc. The, the requirement for cloth increases substantially when compared. Mm. So uh, did the other industries also, I mean the industry which was read in, uh, primarily through the war effort, uh, did they also do well? Yeah, look it would vary by sector, but you know, whether it is jute for bags, whether it is um, medicines, pharmaceuticals, whatever you have, metals an army needs. So it's, a, it's boom time generally for industry. Okay. How much you make will depend on where you're located and what the demand is. <coughs> but to my knowledge, there is no industry which actually suffers in wartime. Now, of course, you know, it's a kind of knife edge thing because there is a fear. Uh, a war is a good thing if you're not actually conquered. If you become a battlefield, then it's all over because your plants and factories are destroyed. But there is a... You know, there's an increase in consumption on many fronts. Soldiers require all kinds of things. So uh, it is boom time in many sectors of the Indian economy. That's a kind of generally, I mean, the, it's not, so I use the DCM stuff uh, as one anecdotal piece. But when the Income Tax Commission says we break down because there's so much money being made, it's not an industry specific. be quite clear on this. Um, and actually, you see, what you're saying speaks to our own day. I never said the economy boomed. I said business does well. And it's the, it's the equivalence of the two which is hugely problematic politically now and, uh, and even then. So people have argued, for example, the historian Bipin Chandra wrote, that every time the relationship of Britain and India got weakened, India did better. There was a loosening of links. He has an article. Now, you know, you can't say that because if three million people have died in the Bengal famine, you're not doing well. But this is my point, that uh, there are enough peasants who are doing well uh, and their, their numbers are large. So that's why I'm saying that the question, how is India doing, is one which conceals a lot because it prevents you from seeing the divergence of experience within India. So I'm not, uh, just to kind of hammer this point to the extent I can, what I'm saying is, and to extend it, that Indian experience is a class experience to a much greater degree than the British experience. And this particularly because Britain is often held up as the class society, where class is important. I'm saying that compared to us, the British don't really know what class is. Because you see what it means in terms of our outcomes. Okay? So, the, the whole methodology of this is if you look at what happens in class terms and regional terms, then you get a picture which you haven't seen because you've always been asking, you meaning we, have always been asking what is happening to the Indian nation. But what happens to sections of the Indian nation can be completely different. And ironically, 
If you have conscription, then that is a great nationalizer because it brings people together uh, when they have a, uh, some fear of getting killed. Now, if we'd had a war, we'd be more of a nation, but whether it would have been worth it, I don't know. Yeah. To, to continue to take off from that position, if, if I can. Uh, she's the she's the chair. So you decide who's yes. to speak in which order. You're the boss now. Yeah. I will look at you and you point. Okay, quick, quick question. Um, what would, or did arguments for conscription exist at that time? No. No. Not to my knowledge. There was some idea that in Punjab you might get very many soldiers, but the idea... Uh, no, I think they felt that if they got too many of us, they'd be in deep trouble. <laughs> in fact, uh, Churchill said during the war, you know, the, the, there, was, uh, there was a big expansion of the Indian Army, and Churchill was the one who said that these people will stab us in the back, cut the sides of the Indian Army. Uh, and it was the more politically correct British uh, including the ones in the army who said, no, 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 these people will be loyal. And they were wrong and Churchill was right because you had the INA and the Royal Indian Naval Mutiny, which was... But, you know, okay, okay, to look at it abstractly, the point is this, that obviously if you're a British ruler of India, the guy you can trust is a Punjabi peasant whose grandfather and great-grandfather has been in the army. Hmm? But the problem is that to fight the Japanese, you need somebody who can uh, steer a ship mm. or, you know, repair to whatever degree possible an aircraft. Mm. Now, that the Punjabi peasant without education cannot do. Mm. So it's a, the great, the, I suppose the complicated word for it would be that this is a contradiction. But what it boils down to is that you would rather have one guy for loyalty, but the circumstances request, uh, require you to have the other person to fight, uh, because that's what the war demands. And it's in a way the contrast between the law and order needs of the government uh, and the, or the law and order or social control needs of the government and the needs of fighting the war, these are contradictory and they pull the government apart. So concrete case, in the naval mutiny, you have people taken into the Navy. They're 16, 17 years old. They work as signalers and telegraphists, which means they can read newspapers, which means that they read in newspapers, they decide that they'll mutiny. And what's worse, from the British point of view, is that in 1946, when they mutiny, they're signalers, so they use their signals equipment, and suddenly you have overnight a mutiny in the Navy in Madras and Bombay and so on and so forth. So it's, you know, they're caught between. Very good question. It's a very good question. So, you know, the slogan of this time is, <clears throat> and this is where, you know, one has to think as a good desi. The slogan of this time is na ek pai na ek bhai. Congress is against the war effort, the British are ruling us. Huh? So, they don't want the British to rule us, they've said quit India. So, the idea is na ek pai na ek bhai. You will not give one pie to the war effort, no money, and you will not give a bhai to fight in the army or job work for the government. And we, of course, decide that bhai ko to nokri mil gai. So let anybody getting a job get the job. But as far as not giving money and donation is concerned, we are all strong Congress supporters. Okay. So uh, in fact, the Congress is able to do precious little at this time because it's telling people don't support, you know, factory owners don't supply the British government. Factory owners are go looking for profits. They're not. They're certainly going to supply the British. And, you know, look, we work out things. The usual thing, people say, look, we are joining the army because independent India, we need its army. We are joining to subvert the system from within. All that stuff goes on. It it's mutates as we go along okay, in different ways. But the Congress, okay, the short answer is the Congress is ineffectual 
because large sections of its support base are doing very well out of the war. Mm -hmm. And the time when it gets into a mess is uh, when um, the British get into a mess is when it looks as if the Japanese are going to invade. You know, just before the Quit India movement, because then everybody says that, you know, profit is irrelevant if you're going to get an enemy overrunning your country. So that's when everybody gets very uh, pro-Congress. But once the Japanese recede and money is being made again, it's quiet. I'm sorry, but when and how do we make this distinction of the Japanese being an enemy with the INA having allied with the Japs, coming with the message of freeing the country? And they did so in the Andamans as well. The idea was to keep marching forth from both sides. So how does it strike the Indian consciousness that the Japanese are coming forth to the Indian subcontinent as enemies rather than liberators? Yeah. See, uh, there is there is the thinking is that India will become a battlefield. Now, if they invade, uh, there, there are two or three things. One is that you have, after all, the Japanese conquer Burma, and there are about four lakhs people who come as refugees from Burma. So they have eyewitness accounts that the Japanese are not nice guys. Hmm? In any case, people are suspicious. They don't want fighting on their territory. With the soldiers running amok is a bad scene. You don't, uh, you know, you don't know how they'll behave, and the fear is that regardless of statements, uh, you don't want your country to become a bad thing. That's... Um, so thank you so much. It was such a treat. Um, I had quite a few questions. Um, but first of all, I was quite struck by your mention of, repeated mention of Bevin as the Labour member. Hmm. A very influential Labour member and so forth. And I could not help but think of the Labour member at that point in time in the Viceroy Executive Ambedkar, Council. Huh? Ambedkar. Mm -hmm. For four and a half years, Ambedkar puts together a large welfare program, uh, the dividends of some of which are then seen in the works of the interim government and afterwards. And, yeah. and, and I was just wondering if you would compare the two and throw some more light on the working of the Labour Department. Uh, with all the caste and class contradictions, uh, much more at play. Play India. In fact, this is only a cue for me to request you to take the story forward to, inclu uh, to include the interim. Uh, how much, I mean, if, if, we, if we cut the thing in the summer of 1945 and not do it and take it forward to the autumn of 1946 and then see, taking our cue from Jagannath Sarkar, that perhaps the 46-49 leadership state is not very different from the 39-46 leadership state, mm. how they seem to behave, how, how there is a continuity in the state, in the two <coughs> state apparatus. Um, so perhaps if you would... Um, say some things more. Uh, this is on the side of the institutional, whether it is the impact on society or uh, the, the, the state. But sir, I was very struck by your mention of the differential impact on different classes, cultivating business, middle industry. And the fact that you said that industrial class, there was a cut in real wage by 30%. Mm. Soon after, in another parallel from Britain, we have elections in both the countries, uh, with again very divergent results in 45 July there, in the winter of 45 here. Why does the 46 election turn the way it turns? Why is the industrial working class, the artisanal class, the middle class, political issues, the economic grievances from the war of the underclass in India not being tapped into in the political campaign? In effect, why is the two-nation theory, the community two-nation theory, as opposed to the class? I mean, it's clear that we have, we have two nations existing between 1939 and 1945, not because they're Hindu and Muslim, but because they are upper class and low class. Um, so I was wondering, why did why, why did this not at all come? Is it is it simply because these people were not franchised uh, education? And that, I suspect that is substantially it. But you know, um, so uh, so you have um, as labor member of the viceroy's executive council, you have Ambedkar, and then independent in India, you have Jagjivan Ram. Now, see, on the interim government, you know better than I. This is your um, this is your specialist field. All I would say is that Ernest Bevin is a leader of the working class. You know, Ambedkar is not a leader of the factory working class of India. You know, uh, so the power of Ernest Bevin comes from being able to say 
that we will stop the factories from working. You people have to do it. Now for that you need a grip on the labor force. This is my sense of it. I may be wrong. But my sense is that uh, with Ambedkar, you can have you can have perspectives you would like, but there is not the kind of same level of control over organized labor which can ensure that his writ will run in factories. Whereas in the British labor movement, they can actually bring their factories to a halt. So I think that is one important distinction. Uh, to bear in mind. And broadening it, it is that really the balance of forces in India is that the business groups are much more um, powerful than labor because there is such a sea of labor outside the factories. So it's, it's structurally also, it's much more difficult for Ambedkar. As for how it goes into welfare, you know, here the point is, that, again, since we're talking about rationing and things, see there's welfare language used in both societies. But there is a sense in which our society goes away from welfare into targeted schemes. Whereas British society goes for the health service, it's universalization of entitlements. We do not have universalization of so, uh, so again, the language is, of course, pro-poor and so on and so forth, but in the way it works out, it's like the rationing system that in independent India, you don't have a permanent address, you can't get a ration card. So if you're the lowest, at the lower levels, you're actually handicapped in access. But in Britain, that's not the case because it's universal. So there is some distinction in this. Um, as for the voting pattern, you know, this is a difficult one and I have an open mind about it in the end. It certainly is true. You see, my rough sense would be you had the voting in 1946 elections was about the voting constituency would have been about 11%. Now, that's more than it seems at the first instance because after all, even with universal franchise, the under 18s would not have a vote and so on. So you double it, but uh, so you double it and so on and so forth. But it does mean that it's a very different game from when you are trying to get the votes of the poorest of the poor by giving them liquor and cash transfers and so on and so forth. So, uh, so that is certainly the case, that, uh, that if, you, if you had a more empowered lower class, which to later years, in later years, uh, democracy has done to some extent, then you would have had different outcomes. Is it also a missed opportunity for the CPA? Well, uh, missed opportunity for the Communist Party. I mean, there was a bit of going on in Varli, a bit going on in Telangana. But yeah, but uh, you see, the problem in this is that one can say that, supposing one says, that the communists should have done better. It's actually very difficult to say how exactly they could have done better. You know, this is the, there is a problem of hindsight with this, that you can say that people made wrong choices, how exactly they would have, should have played it to achieve a, a better result. I mean, it's difficult for a historian to actually say this. So do we then get sucked into the vortex of religious communitarianism and nationalism as we gallop towards 46. Yeah, so, um, okay. So uh, let's shift the argument a little bit that the, it was a traditional line by many historians that on the eve of independence, the left should have called for revolution and because it didn't and didn't take to the streets and wasn't militant, you had communalism. Now, <clears throat> I've never been completely persuaded by this because what are they to take call for people to come to the streets for. You, the whole idea is that come to the streets to throw the British out. Mm -hmm. The British have said, we are going. Yeah. So how do you mobilize people to do something which, when the other side is saying, look, we are going in any case? 
you know. If on the other hand they say overthrow the upper classes, then who's to know whether it would have worked or not? Famously in Europe it didn't. Uh, and that was Gumshi's great lament. So, uh, I, it's, it's part of being, I suppose, more sympathetic to history's failures <laughs> than one. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Settings were right until there. Also, the popularization of the idea of class struggle as such, as an idea, uh, I'm, I'm not bit too, I'm not very sure of its uh, currency in that sense. To, at least during the 1940s. Yeah, I mean, you had um, you had articulate communist leaders, mm -hmm. and reading their publications is a nightmare. Correct. So, uh, yeah, but I, it, you know, look, there is a school of history writing uh, which can be summarized as if only I, whoever that is, was leading the Communist Party, India would be <laughs> flying red flags everywhere. I'm skeptical of that. Huh? There is, uh, you know, uh, the, the idea that history departments would be better at leading revolutions <laughs> is an attractive but unsustainable one. I, um, is, uh, is there time or? I, I, I mean, I just wondered if you'd like to talk a bit more about uh, what you think of Subhash Chandra Bose's role in the Second World War and, uh, and, 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 you know, the, the, the um, what do you think he was up to and would he have been, uh, was the Congress essentially determined uh, from when was the Congress determined to kind of push him out and, and, and was his actions in the Second World War a consequence of that or a, or a regardless? No, the, with Subhash Chandra Bose, it's, uh, it's a brave man's miscalculation. Uh, he obviously thought that... Uh, so it's not like he, he had nowhere else to go, he chose to go to... No, he chose to go. Look, if somebody had to win the war and somebody had to lose, if he obviously thought that the Axis would win the war. Um, you see, all this is being recorded, but uh, all, all I can say is that, uh, and therefore I have to think twice before I say this, but I'll say it anyway, that if he had been right, then somebody who's a historian might be very prominent in Indian politics and uh, Rahul Gandhi might be a professor at Harvard. <laughs> so history has many mysteries. Um, but I really shouldn't say that when I'm <laughs> being recorded. So, <laughs> so, oh, it's in a, a lighter vein. If, if, if I could get a second. The investigation commission that you mentioned, hmm. so of course famously comes out of the New Yorker. Yeah, but, yeah. but there's a finance commission and also, so there, yes. you know, there are multiple sources. There, 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 there's, a, there's a context to it. But, um, and you mentioned at one point that a lot of Congress supporters actually did quite well during the war. Groups and communities. Of course, started. of course. Now, a lot of, they, them, they therefore were up for this kind of, uh, you know, this famous scuttle of the budget of February 47. Uh -huh. um, what would you, your, your thoughts be on this combined, then, then getting back at the Congress like no, look, this is your period. No, no, you no. Don't no, ask no, me no. about it. This is your specialist no, no, period. What would you think about no, because, it? That no, because the larger question. You know more than I do. Yeah. No, because the question that I was getting at is did the Congress and the League miss the war? Miss and the Congress missed the war because a lot of its leadership was in the MFA's jail. Yeah. Did, they, did they miss the politics and the economics of the war? The League and the Communists were outside. I mean, we have spoken about the Communists, but what is the League doing? We, 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 I mean, despite a lot of work on the League, we are not very clear about what the League is doing. Did, they, did, they, did the major parties miss the war? See, I would say that everybody made mistakes. Subhash Bose thought the Axis would win. The Congress thought the Japanese would be more successful, otherwise they wouldn't have opposed the Quit India movement if they knew the result uh, of the whole thing. Then they'd have uh, taken the trips off. I mean, if you, if you do a thought experiment, if they knew the way... Yeah. So, you know, they, there is no question that everybody operates with incomplete information. If they knew the way things would turn out, then rejecting the Crips offer was a big mistake. But it's a big mistake because we know what happened afterwards. They didn't. 
at that time Aurobindo said, take it, take it, it's good for you. But they didn't and the reason which is given is that Gandhi thought that they're losing, the British are losing. Hence that famous statement that it's a post-dated check to which some, some journalist added the failing bank. Well, thank you for your questions and uh, 